Welcome to more World of Warplanes content from the Noble Q, and in this video I'll be looking at the reward aircraft for the current Marathon, the Tier 7 British fighter, the Spitfire 16. Hello there, and here we are on the tarmac outside the hangar looking at the Spitfire 16, which at first blush looks quite different from the Tier 7 Tech Tree British Spitfire, the Spitfire 9, but it is in fact the same aircraft. The difference is the engine, this one has a Merlin manufactured by Packard in America, the Merlin 266, which incidentally was optimized for low altitude fighting. And that leads us to the discussion of the differences between the Spitfire 9 and the Spitfire 16 as represented in game. First, the clipped wings at low altitude. These were employed to try and improve the roll rate of the Spitfire. And that is actually reflected in the characteristics of the aircraft, as we'll discover shortly. And the other notable feature, of course, is what we call the cut down fuselage. Um, but normally we'd refer to as a bubble canopy. Now this aircraft certainly did exist and was employed extensively in the light fighter role. Actually, it was also used for ground attacking. It could carry a, a payload. That's not featured in the game. Right, so what we're going to do next is look at a spreadsheet uh, containing the information for all of the tier seven fighters. If you don't want to look at that, use the link below the video to skip ahead to another part of it. So here's one of my familiar workbooks with all 15 of the tier seven fighters displayed. I'll just scroll sideways so you can see that they are actually there. There we go. I'll take a moment to explain how the spreadsheet works. If you already know that piece, feel free to uh, use the link below to skip ahead to the statistics discussion itself. So the Spitfire 16 is actually in columns E and F here. I've given precedence to the Tech Tree Spitfire 9 right here in columns C and D. And the rest of the fighters all occupy two columns of their own off to the right, as you've just seen. And down the left, we have the characteristics that are visible in the hangar UI. In the case of the gun armament, I've what supplemented this with a bit of information from a third party website regarding those characteristics there. Configuration was stock in every case. Ordnance, it says it's mounted here, but that's irrelevant. There's no ordnance on fighters, as you know. Equipment was removed and the pilot sent back to the barracks. The modules are all top. Where you see a gold color behind the name of the aircraft, that indicates that it's a reward or premium aircraft. Otherwise, green indicates best in class characteristic. Light blue, second best in class. Light purple, third best in class. And then down below, I reverse the logic using red colors for worst in class figures. Okay, so let's get onto the characteristics themselves. I did a notes from the control tower video with a section on the basic characteristics of the Spitfire 16 previously. The figures here have changed very slightly, probably due to rounding error. There's nothing different um, that I need to report. If you watch that video, then these figures are going to be almost exactly the same. And in that video, I mentioned that the gun armament for the 16, for Mark 16 is exactly the same as the Spitfire 9. So there's nothing to see here. The same DPS of 350, which is OK for a turn fighter, which is what I think the 16 is. Spoilers immediately. Um, but nothing special. Survivability is identical to the Spitfire 16. And the fire resistance is useful. Um, and that's allowed me to experiment, as you'll see a little bit later in the video. OK, airspeed. Again, not too great. In fact, the cruise speed is slightly lower, but the boost speed is slightly higher. I did mention that the boost duration is eight seconds, which is useful uh, because that's two seconds more than the term fighters largely in this comparison. And that again gives you min um, the possibility, if you want, of fitting a combined injection boost system on this aircraft. I wouldn't recommend it, but at least it's there as an opportunity. Maneuverability is ever so slightly better, and that's because of the clipped wings. Here we are, the roll rate, 140 degrees per second. And that is quite useful. It's second best in class. That may give you a chance of evading an inexperienced pilot in a theoretically more maneuverable aircraft behind you by doing a series of quick rolls. Uh, you may be able to get him off your tail. And the altitude performance is uh, slightly worse. Uh, as you can see, about 300 feet uh, off the maximum optimum altitude and the service ceiling. I guess that translates to about 100 meters. Where does it stand compared to the other turn fighters? Well, you're going to have to watch out for the A7M Repu, which in pretty much every regard is a superior aircraft and certainly is in terms of maneuverability. The only thing that you may be able to do is get above it uh, and dive on it uh, using slash and burn techniques, uh, boosting away after you've attacked it. 
Um, I'm not going to be able to do that with the K84 Hayati, which is pretty much got the same sort of maneuverability, but much better altitude performance. The Yak-3 is at least as mobile, if not more mobile, than the Spitfire 16. Lower uh, altitude performance, however, so again, you may be able to implant, use slash and burn uh, tactics against this. And then we get into a couple of premium aircraft, the Yaks. The Yak-3T is marginally less mobile, but similar. And the Yak-3R, the 3RD is marginally more mobile. And then we start getting into the LA-7 and the LA-9RD, where we're starting to blend towards the high energy fighters. Um, these are going to have the same sort of boost, but less maneuverability, although they do have very good roll rates. Do watch out for that. And uh, the armament, particularly on the LA-7, is better. Uh, is commensurate with the Spitfire. The, the LA-9RD is considerably worse. Probably not so much of a threat to you as the uh, term fighters. And then we start getting into the high energy fighters, which are going to rely on speed and altitude to outperform the Spitfire. And you already know that you're going to have to be looking upwards and making sure you're not being caught uh, out with one of these diving on you if you can possibly avoid it. However, if it chooses to turn fight with you, then you're in for um, a good time. We go down to the worst in class figures. Well, the survivability figures are all compressed anyway. So it's often the figures that are pretty good uh, in the uh, best in class comparison are actually uh, also worst in class. Nothing to see here other than I'll just point out that fire resistance again. The airspeed, it's okay for a turn fighter. Um, some of the turn fighters are certainly a bit slower, certainly under boost, and you do have that advantage of two extra seconds of boost. The maneuverability, need to watch the optimum range here. Uh, Spitfire needs to be kept within its optimum range to keep this maneuverability, which you're going to need every ounce of uh, to compete against the, the turn fighters. And then the altitude performance, we can see some red appearing, reflecting that the uh, altitude performance of the Spitfire 16 is inferior, not only to the Spitfire 9, uh, but several of the other aircraft in this um, comparison. For instance, the turn fighting Ki-84, uh, which is very versatile indeed, much more so than the Spitfire, I would um, suggest. And of course, you wouldn't expect uh, the Spitfire to have the kind of altitude performance that you see in some of these high altitude fighters. So where does this place the Spitfire 16? Well, it's certainly not the best turn fighter at Tier 7, that's for sure. Careful build and you can make it extremely competitive. The guns are serviceable without being best in class. Uh, again, you, with careful management the five seconds overheat time, you can make them quite effectively. Although do note that to be really effective, you have to be quite close to your enemy, 1,772 feet, so that you can employ these Brownings alongside the Hispano cannons. In terms of airspeed, it's okay as a turn fighter. It's clearly not going to be anywhere near as fast as the uh, um, high energy fighters. So this places it firmly, in my opinion, in the turn fighter class where it has severe competition and will have to be flown with care and will have to be built extremely well. And we'll have to have a pilot with appropriate pilot skills to make you competitive. Okay, I think that's enough in the numbers. Let's go and see how I've set mine up. So here we are looking at the Spitfire 16 on the tarmac again. And the first thing to note is that uh, the aircraft is specialized. Now I did play through the entirety of the marathon turn the aircraft, but I must admit I used tokens to specialize it immediately so we could see what it would be like when you've got it um, in that condition. However, we'll just have a quick look and see what's missing when you're in stock. And as you can see of the four equipment slots, you'll be missing one on the airframe. And of the five consumable slots, again, you'll be missing one on the airframe. I'll just pop it back into specialist and let's go and see what I've actually done with the aircraft. Okay, so here we are. And I've used a, a gun sight here on the cockpit uh, slot. No surprises there, I want to improve the accuracy of the guns. However, it's also important because I feel this aircraft being a little bit sluggish, you're probably going to want to work on the engine um, as much as you can, even if you do as I have done, build this largely for maneuverability. So we'll talk about that in terms of pilot skills in a moment or two. In the airframe, what's this you may be asking? Why has this got a little Japanese flag above the lightweight airframe? Well, this is special project equipment. 
Uh, and just as an aside, special project equipment began appearing in the game as rewards for ratings events in probably early 2019 and onwards, and has since been quietly dropped. So if you haven't got any special project equipment in your depot right now, at the moment, you're not going to have an opportunity to get any more because I haven't seen any more events of that type for a very long time. There is, of course, experimental equipment, which is better than your standard equipment, but it's not as good as the special project equipment. I happen to have this lying around, I discovered when I was setting up my Spitfire 16, um, so I decided to employ it. But this is pretty filthy. Okay, and to also improve the maneuverability, I've used a lightweight power unit. Now, if you're going to try and build this for speed, which I don't recommend, the eight seconds boost that you have will allow you to put on a combined injection boost system if that's your desire. Not something I particularly want to experiment with. However, to try and get a little bit more speed out of the AI craft, I've then gone for the ultimate polished skin. But I've gone to the trouble of selecting out the bonus characteristics there in orange on this panel that you're looking at now to improve the maneuverability because a polished skin has a negative effect on maneuverability and I've picked out the bonus characteristics that offset that negative effect on maneuverability, as you can see there. When it comes to consumables, because the fire resistance is 60, because I haven't got an uprated engine which adversely affects the um, um, fire resistance, I've decided to experiment for once on my fighters with a first aid dressing package. And the jury's out as far as I'm concerned. I've played a few games in the Spitfire. Um, I haven't been set on fire that, that many times, but when it does happen, it's hugely inconvenient because you take a lot of damage. We can talk about pilot skills in a moment to try and offset that. Uh, but uh, also I have found it advantageous to be able to put my pilot back in um, when he's been injured. Although I have noticed it's not that unusual for your pilot to be injured, for you to heal him and him for, to be injured instantly uh, by somebody firing uh, what feels like gold ammunition, but probably isn't, it's just RNG. But bear that in mind. The rest of consumables are fairly obvious. The pneumatic control assist, that's to provide uh, 10, 10 seconds of increased uh, maneuverability, uh, particularly used for flying another Spitfire 16 or one of the uh, turn fighters, which in theory have um, higher maneuverability. If you have a control surface damage, the emergency control system is the uh, consumable to mount for me. Engine cooling, I see you see this on virtually all of my aircraft. That gives you 10 seconds of extra boost, provided you've got some available. And then universal ammunition. So if we talk about the pilot, well, of course, this is going to be a crew trainer. So possibly you're not going to be building uh, a pilot specifically for the 16. And thanks to a um, follower on Twitch, Flying Dutchman, I decided to follow his suggestion of putting in the special pilot for the Tornado which is Millie Elliott. Now, have I gone past her? Ah, there you are. Okay, let's pop Millie Elliott in. Now, this, on the face of it, this may seem a little bit of a strange choice because, as you may very well know, the Tornado Master skill only applies um, to the Tornado and won't take effect on any other aircraft, including the Spitfire 16. However, Millie Elliott does have this special skill, the Air Acrobat, which replaces the standard Air uh, Aerobatics Expert skill and basically doubles its effect. So 4% uh, maneuverability increase and also an accuracy improvement of firing at actively maneuvering targets, i.e. most of them that you'll be firing at. So that's really nice to have. As for other skills, well, certainly I'd prioritize aerodynamics expert, whether or not you go for a speed or a maneuverability build. And then I'd prior prioritize engine guru one, certainly over marksman one. And in fact, although I would probably put on marksman one when I have another couple of free skill points, as soon as I got a third one, I will probably put it on engine guru three. And then I might even go for resilience next, as opposed to working on the marksman one and marksman two skills. Personally, I think the accuracy, given the setup I've got with Millie Elliott in it uh, and uh, the gun sight, is good enough to go with, forego these skills until later. Uh, and I would definitely work on the speed of the aircraft and also this resilience skill. Right, so let's talk about the paint jobs that come with the aircraft. And I can't say I'm very fond of this one. But what it does, it converts, it gives you 5% extra aircraft experience. Well, of course, you should have ticked Accelerate Crew Training on this more or less immediately. And that converts the aircraft experience into crew experience. 
However, there is an alternative, and I would employ this alternative personally, and that's the Chrome scheme, which gives you 3% extra cruise speed. And I think that's worth having on a fairly sluggish aircraft like the Spitfire. You could, of course, just apply the normal camouflages, which are available as well. Okay, if we look at the nose arc, so this is actually useful. This is a higher um, bonus than normal, the 5% crew experience. And again, that will go to uh, that will go to your crew every time you fly with this. I would keep this on, and it's quite a good-looking emblem as well. So why not? Nose art, I should say. I like that. We'll keep that. Sadly, this emblem with the roses of the houses of Lancaster and York, brownie points if you know which rose is which house, only gives you 2% crew experience. So if you have the seventh uh, um, birthday emblem for uh, for war, World of Warplanes, which is this one. I would use that one instead because that gives you 5%. Um, uh, I've picked off the wrong one. Let's go and do that properly. My apologies. Where are you? It's that one. Okay, and that gives you 5% aircraft experience again, and that will be redirected to your crew as well if you've got that uh, box ticked for accelerate crew training so we'll apply all those and that's how i'm going to set this aircraft up in terms of its uh, paint job okay i think it's time to go and see how this aircraft performs in battle and the map for the upcoming battle is albion it's the final argument variant five sectors laid out in the five spots of a die pattern and what we have here are is a central air base which therefore strategically and tactically is extremely important and just to refresh our uh, memory, this being a repair air base, not only does it produce the five resources, three resources every five seconds, but also it can act as a spawn point, really useful in the center. You can choose a different aircraft of the same tier if you're destroyed, or you can have your aircraft fully repaired, provided you own this, of course. On one axis, there are a pair of military bases, uh, and these are certainly very important, arguably more important than the air base. Um, and then on the other axis, a pair of garrisons that just have the three resources every five seconds. Of course, the military bases, apart from the fact they don't fire at each other, will uh, target uh, enemy sectors and try and flip them for you with uh, by firing rockets at them. So if we look at the order of battle, and I'm bottom tier here, uh, I have an IL-20 Grand Attacker and a J-8M and a KI-94 for top tier aircraft and a P-47N as the other tier seven on our side. We look to the other side. Well, for a start, they've got an extra tier eight, which is difficult. And they've got a B-29C Super Fortress, which is specialized. This is foreboding. They also have a heavy, which we don't, P-1056. They also have a Grand Attacker, another IL-20, and they have a J-8M as well. And then their T-7 is a P-47N. Well, on the face of it, this is pretty poor matchmaking. We don't have a um, human heavy or a bomber to counter their bomber or their human heavy. So let's see how this battle panned out. Now, in order to get this video out as quickly as possible, I haven't waited until I've had a stellar battle in this aircraft. I think you'll see well enough what this aircraft can do from this video, uh, this uh, battle replay, and in any case, the other parts of the video will probably have more interest to you. So, Unsurprisingly, with a turn fighter, I'm going straight for the middle and to try and secure the uh, repair airbase. Let my team get slightly ahead of me. I'm fragile and I'm bottom tier. I want to be able to see what's going on and select my targets when perhaps they're busy doing something else. And there's quite a few on the uh, left here, unusually. So uh, I'm shooting at an air defense uh, zero. Swing around to try and finish it off sense that we've got a lot behind me and immediately swing round to confront it. There's a bot, the Yak-15, that's a bot, nevertheless it's a dangerous opponent and as you can see it turned on a sixpence. It wasn't quite as agile the second time. And the third time it decided to straighten up and shoot at something else and that gives me the opportunity to put it down. My team has managed to secure the airbase, which is good. I take the opportunity to do some extra damage to the air defence aircraft. Probably shouldn't have. Get my engine shot out by an ME 109TL, which powers away into the distance, taking all but... Uh, in fact, I don't think it actually took any damage from me. 
well, maybe one or two points there because it's uh, stayed within range. So I want to try and limp back and get repairs. However, I'm keeping an eye on the minimap and I can see that the ME109TL has come back for me. Fortunately, by this time my engine re-engages. I'm able to stay with the 109TL long enough to destroy it this time. I have a cheeky shot at the ground attacker and actually add that to my kill list as well. And very much it was a question here in my mind of trying to do as much damage as possible and to see how things pan panned out and the assumption that the enemy bomber would actually just flip every se sector going. And the kill on their Fokker Wolf there. Straighten up, swing around and that's the Yak-15 going for me again. Had a bit of a thing for me this Yak-15 during this game. Managed to swing away from my KI-94-2. Focke Wolf is just within range. That's the A8 version, which has a fairly poor engine for a Tier 7. So I'm able to keep up with it. Swing around to see what else is still in the centre. It's the 109TL. I'll wait until I'm within 1700 feet of it and open up. Begin to whittle it down. And uh, I get assistance there. Felt like I did most of the damage to it, but apparently not. My team have managed to secure a military base and also the local garrison belonging to the enemy, so we're three to two up at the moment. The game is more balanced than I might have thought, and as you can see, that's the B-29 pounding the airfield. Well, with a bit of luck we can shoot more things in the airfield and reverse the damage that he's done in terms of flipping the sector to his team. That was close. We're on the verge of losing this, but I'm able to put down the Fokker Wolf in time to just halt the enemy's progress, at least for a little while longer. This turns out to be the Act 15 that didn't pick on me this time, so I shoot it down. Pilot is injured by something uh, going through, and uh, I heal him. It's not often you'll see, hear me say that with respect to a fighter, that I've just used my first aid dressing kit. I discussed the reasons why earlier in the video. The enemy P-47 swings around conveniently in front of me. I set him on fire. Hasn't got anywhere near the manoeuvrability I have and I kill him. And we're now four sectors to one up, so we have some very good work being done by the team. I decide at this point that uh, we need to try and ram home our advantage I would have liked to go to the military base. Unfortunately, I don't pay enough attention to the, en the aircraft coming towards the air base. And the Fokker Wolf put some big hits into me. As I mentioned before, it hasn't got much of an engine, so I'm able to chase it down easily enough. Decide to see what's trying to contest me. It's the P1056. I am able to do a little damage to him. He chooses to run away, unsurprisingly. And we're very close to taking this sector. It's not going to be shooting him down that will do it. I need to try and find an air defence aircraft. And he doesn't fall to me to actually do it anyway. But this time the P1056 goes into a slow climb. That allows me to catch up with him. And slightly to my surprise, I am able to kill him. And unsurprisingly, the ME109TL shoots out my engine again. And she's swing around quickly enough, and I return the favour. Shoot out his engine. That allows me to stay with him, even though I've got no engine of my own. And at long range, I finish him off. Now, during that engagement, we lost the airfield. We're still 3-2 to two up, but that's a bit of a blow, especially as I need repairs. Now, I'm not sure what the enemy ground attacker is doing here, but he's in a vulnerable position and two of us set about him. I get some assistance as he is destroyed. 
I decide I'm going to try and work on the fringes of the airfield and perhaps pick aircraft off if I can. Our enemy J8M dives obligingly straight into the water. So that starts us on the process of taking the airfield, although we lose an aircraft almost immediately. That sets us back. The F-15 is not uh, paying any attention to me. It's engaged with another aircraft. And it enables me to swing round and help that aircraft destroy him. Again, still working on the periphery. Managed to take down one of the air defence aircraft. Have a pop at the heavy as it flies through and then leave it alone. It's going too fast for me. However, that almost leads me on to another air defence aircraft. So I take the opportunity to shoot that. And in shooting that down, we flip the airfield. And we have a 3-2 lead again. Very nearly got their uh, uh, military base as well. This is going much better than I could ever have hoped. Don't want to be hit by the heavy, so I avoid. And don't want to be hit by whatever was following him. I should avoid that as well, and then swing around behind him. That's another one of the Fockwolf A8 again. 190 A8. That's an easy kill. And now we have taken their military base. I can pick up repairs for the most part. Or in fact to completion. Again I avoid the heavy as best I can, get my engine shot out. That's interesting, that's at least the third time in this battle that I've lost the engine. To be fair I haven't noticed it in my other battles, but if that continues to be a trend we might have to think about doing something about protecting the engine. Destroy the yak, and the game comes to a conclusion. It's a four chevron battle, 17,590 personal points. This is a good win. So let's review the outcome of this battle. And on this occasion, we can see from the centre it's a four chevron battle, grade two fighter. We'll see in a moment it was very close to a grade one. And that grows 243,075 credits. 70,000 of that came from a premium account bonus. There's also a mission for another 35,000 or thereabouts. If we go into the message box, we can see that there were no expenses. Uh, aircraft wasn't shot down, so no repair costs, and I was using prepaid consumables. 3,711 experience. Uh, 1,200 of that was a bonus from a premium account, and there was a, a 120 coming from another source as well, on top of the base of 2,395. 185 free experience, of which 59 came from the premium account bonus. No tokens on this occasion, but a couple of epic achievements, the Akumatsu Medal and the Winged Legend. Going to the Personal Score tab, we can see that one of the class-specific missions was complete, this one. One more aircraft for aerial targets destroyed would have pushed that to 17, and that would have been enough for a 5 chevron battle. What let us down uh, mostly was the capture points for attacking. 17,590 uh, personal points, uh, two sectors captured, 16 aerial targets destroyed, damage to aerial targets of 5,064 with 27 critical hits, 540 capture points in total, 360 for defending and 180 for attacking. Turn to the team score tab, we can see that was enough for first place both by personal points and by chevrons. Good effort here from the KR-94, decent effort from the IL-20, important given that the enemy side had a bomber. And on the opposing side, well, unsurprisingly, the bomber came top, and their heavy uh, had a decent game as well. Frankly, this was a really good win um, in unfavourable matchmaking. And that concludes my look at the Spitfire 16. And this is an aircraft you are going to have to build really well in order to be competitive against the Japanese term fighters and the Yak term fighters. And certainly as a stock aircraft, you're probably going to struggle in it initially. So that then prompts the question of, is it actually worth going through the marathon to obtain this aircraft? Well, if you have the time, it's best to pick up a, a what's going to be a premium aircraft for free. As for paying for it, well, only you can decide whether you want to use your money on certificates for this aircraft. However, almost all of the experience that you have of flying the Spitfire 16 can be obtained from the Tier 7 Tech Tree British Spitfire 9. Albeit, I think this aircraft is just slightly better, particularly because of that manoeuvrability figure uh, on the roll rate. But you won't be missing anything if you don't obtain this aircraft. It's for you to judge. Okay, 
I hope you found that useful and informative, and if you did, I hope you'll come and see my future content. But until then, this is The Noble Q signing out.